Okay, we had talked earlier about installment land contracts. So we also have purchase money mortgages. This is another type of seller financing, but this is where the title is given to the buyer at the closing. So if we have a purchase money mortgage, I'm the buyer, I'm gonna get a note at closing, but I'm gonna get the deed. So I would have legal um, title at the closing and the seller would have to take a note back and he would hold a mortgage. So if he wanted to foreclose, he'd have to go to court. It'd have to be a judicial foreclosure, right? So this is a purchase money mortgage, which is the exact opposite of an installment land contract, which means that um, the seller is still seller financing. However, it is um, the seller is going to hold the deed, the title, until it's paid off. All right. So in this particular case, a purchase money mortgage is just the opposite. Now we have some other types of loans that you might see out there: graduated payment loans, where your payment's going to get bigger every month, but it will, that means that you're going to pay down your pay down your principal more. Right, you're going to pay down your principal faster because it'll all go to principal. So that's what that is. Um, package loans includes real and personal property. A lot of condominiums on the beachfront are sold as package loans because they have the furniture that um, goes with the condos. So they just lump it all into one price. The banks understand that that's customary. Um, so that would be a package loan goes because they're going to pay for both. A blanket mortgage, let's say I was gonna buy, I'm a builder, developer, and I'm gonna buy 200 acres of land. And I'm gonna buy that 200 acres of land, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, let's say it's a farmer who's not gonna farm anymore, and they wanna just sell the land. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say to the farmer, okay, I wanna develop this land, and I'm gonna build one acre properties, and I'm gonna build 200 of them. So every time I build one of those houses, I'm going to pay you for one acre until it's all built out and paid up. So when I sell 10, you're going to be, get paid for 10. When I sell the 11th one, you'll get paid the 11th one, 12th one, and so on. So that's a blanket mortgage. We're going to pay for it in sections as we build and sell them. All right. It's also called quilted land. So if you can think of it that way, um, the squares on the quilt, as we go through it. Growing equity lines, this is that uh, much like a graduated payment loan where we're gonna keep paying more on the equity every month and pay that loan down faster. We won't have that loan for that much more, All right? That is what growing equity loans are. Um, construction loans. Understand that construction loans are probably one of the riskiest loans that, um, uh, that banks make. Because what's going to happen is they're going to lend. Usually construction loans are 75% of the cost of the build. So that means that the first 25% has got to come from the buyer. And they put up their money first and they give it to the builder and the builder gets started. And then what's going to happen is the bank is going to make draws. And they're going to draw it at you'll get 20% of your money at the first. And when certain level, you know, you pour the found it, foundation, we'll send somebody out, somebody out to check. We'll, you put up the rock, we'll, we'll check then and so on. Put the roof on, we'll check that. And every time you reach one of these milestones, they're gonna give you 20% more of what you had until they get to the end. And when you get the certificate of the occupancy, you get that last 20%. But what's happening is in this construction loan is that you're the buyer and you put up your money first, the bank, when the bank starts lending that money, it's interest only. You're gonna pay interest only on that until they finish the job. Once they finish that house, get the CEO, certificate of occupancy, they're gonna turn that loan from a construction loan into what's called a takeout loan. And basically it's gonna become a regular mortgage. At that point, they're gonna figure out what it's like. To, they're gonna amortize it, put it all together. Your interest payments will stop on that level. And then they're gonna do principal and interest over that 25 years or 30 years.
all right? But while you're doing it, it's still only, um, you're only paying interest only. Now, the problem is this, they've had so many builders who have just gone and built half a house and somebody flakes out and decides that they're not gonna do anymore. So what happens? The buyer's out all of their money and the bank's out money that the mortgage, that the uh, builder didn't complete or the builder goes bankrupt or anything else. So this is a pretty high risk loan for the bank or yourself also, but they wanna make sure that this goes through. So they're divvying out the funds. Now I gotta tell you, before the banks will lend money to a builder, they're gonna qualify the builder. They're gonna make sure that that builder can, is gonna finish this project because they don't want them walking away and not finishing the project. Um, sale and lease back. A sale and lease back. You see, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised how many of these you see. If you go to a new, new homes community, usually the office that they're sitting in in one of these nice new houses, that house doesn't belong to them anymore. What they'll do is they'll sell the model home and they'll lease it back for a year or until the project is complete. So somebody else owns it, but then the builder's paying rent, paying back that owner to use the property <clears throat> for however long. So that's a sale and lease back, right? They don't have the overhead, you pay the taxes, you keep the equity, but they're gonna pay you back. They're gonna pay you like a rent to rent the building, a lease if you will, for as, long, for as long as they figure that this is going to work. If you're over 65, you can get a reverse annuity mortgage based on your equity in your house. If you're interested in one of those, get one of those bankers that are good with this. Um, these are paid, uh, they will pay money to the borrower, but then when they go after that bar borrower expires, it's gonna get have to get repaid, right? Through the sale of the house or what have you. Is there's a lot of nooks and crannies in this one. Have a mortgage banker who sells these things um, explain it to you. Just know they're out there, right? Um, we may see a buy down. Builders incentives. They could say, hey, we'll give you a three, two, one buy down. And what that means is they'll pay 3% of your <clears throat> Buyers loan the first year, 2% the second, 1% the third, and then they're on their own. But wouldn't we want that in points? If I can get them to pay 3% the first year, what's that going to do to my interest rate for 30 years? It's going to lower three-eighths of a point, right? So maybe the best way is not to take a buy down, but to take points. That's some way to look at it. But as a broker, you want to talk to your buyer about that, right? You want to talk to your buyer about that. Bridge loans. Let's say we have a house to sell and then we want to buy another one. Maybe I need a short-term loan from the bank to go and put a down payment on one while I'm selling this one. That's a bridge loan, something that'll get me there. And then once I sell this one, I pay back the bridge and I um, move on to purchase that other house. Short-term loans, right? Any kind of residential financing arrangement where we borrow money under a second mortgage just for, it might only be 90 days worth of money, right? Bridges, short, right? Get us from one spot to another. Priorities, who gets priority? Remember I said first in, first first paid? Let's say I'm that developer and I'm gonna buy that 200 acres from that farmer. Don't I need a bigger mortgage from a commercial bank that's gonna pay me? I might pay, let's say I pay a million dollars for these 200 acres, whatever that comes to. Well, in order for me to develop this, am I gonna need more than a million dollars to do road and infrastructure and build the houses and everything else? So I'm gonna to have to go to a bank and I'm gonna to have to say, hey, I might need $10 million. Can you lend me $10 million? Which is not outrageous, believe me, if you're developing this kind of property, probably more than that. So the bank, the big bank is gonna say, if I'm gonna give you $10 million, we're gonna want first priority. We're gonna want first position. So I got to go back to the bot, to the landowner and I have to say, okay, the bank will not give me a loan to develop this land unless they get first position on the mortgage. However, you were first. And remember we said first in is first in is first paid? In mortgages, what will happen is that that big bank will say, if you don't give me first position, you don't get no money. So the second, so the landowner says, well, I really want to be paid. 
And I go to the landowner and I said, I can't use your land if they don't give me the money. So then I can't buy your land or I'll go, I can't, we got to buy something else. So now it's that farmer who's selling that land. I got to say, all right, look, I'll take, I'll subordinate my loan. It's called subordination. I'll subordinate my loan to that bank for the development of the property. So even though my land purchase was first and it was probably recorded first, okay, the, 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 um, it will be recorded as a junior lien or second position because big bank is going to come in and give me $10 million later on and they are going to give me that money with first priority. Otherwise, they're not going to lend me the money. So I got to give them first priority lien, okay? You got to give them a first priority lien. So that's what happens there. So that's a junior mortgage, right? Um, even though they were recorded after us, after the first dirt lien, they are going to um, take first position. So if this thing goes sideways, the bank, the big bank gets paid first and the farmer gets paid if there's anything left. That's a junior mortgage, right? And that's what happens. So then we go into, so those are all the different types of loans. Now we get to um, what us in the banking field used to call loan prevention, underwriting. Have you ever dealt with loan underwriting? They will try to, to, they will make getting a loan very, very difficult. They're tough and they want every T, every T dotted uh, across, every I dotted. They want to know information. They will make sure. We went from zero document loans to full document loan today. Zero document loan back in the day, back in 2005, if you could fog a mirror and sign your name, we would give you 125% loan so you can buy some furniture, right? We were giving it to everybody. And what happened? We ended up in a bunch of foreclosures, right? Um, now, you can't do that, right? Now you can't do that. Now it's full document. We used to call them ninja loans back in the day. No income, no job. Right. And we'd give them money. We give them money. If you've seen the movie The Big Short, you know what I'm talking about. OK, they would just lend these interest only loans, assuming that the market was never going to come down. Turns out it made a mess for those of us who have lived through it. <clears throat> well, now try to go through the bank if you've just bought a house. Right. I know Kayla was just saying that um, even through the USDA, she had to give them a ton of information as do all these banks require all of these things, right? So they're gonna do credit checks, right? They're gonna do, they're gonna make sure you hit the credit limits. They're gonna check your background. They're gonna do adequacy of assets to close, make sure you got the money. Do you have stability of income? How long have you been waiting, right? Um, types of acceptable income. If you're, a, um, if you're a 1099er, which I am, and as some of you will be, all right, you're gonna to have to show a couple of years of income as gross income. You're not just gonna get away with what's on your W-2. You're gonna to have to show you know, what it is. Now, as a 1099, employee, uh, a 1099 worker, we write off a lot of stuff, right? We have a lot of expenses that go on with doing our day-to-day, -day, which reduces your what? Your gross. So you gotta deal with your banker and try to get that to come through, all right? Um, we also look at, uh, you know, the interest rate up or down, are they going to pay discount points, right? Are you going to pay uh, origination fees, whatever, what kind of profits do we have? Right? What kind of profits do we have? All right. So how do we know how much we're going to lend? Let's worry about the conventional loan here. Let's say you qualify. So a borrower's, borrower's expense to income ratios usually cannot exceed 28% for housing expenses to gross income and 36% for the recurring debt to gross income. What the heck did you just ask me, Sam? All right, here's what we're gonna do. Let me show you how this works. Remember 28 and 36. If I make Monthly, this is monthly gross income, okay? Monthly gross. So let's say I make um, 
$3,000 a month. And my wife makes $2,000 a month. Okay. That gives us $5,000 in monthly income. We're not worried about it. monthly gross, not even tax. The bank is going to look at this and they're going to say, well, do you have any commercial credit? Commercial credit is anything like a car payment, credit cards, student loans, alimony, things that you're going to pay on a monthly basis over time. If I say no, they're going to take this 5,000 and they're going to multiply it by 28%. Okay. And if they multiply by 28%, so we have 5,000 times 28%, that means that my principal interest taxes and insurance cannot be any more than $1,400. That's what it would be. So we can figure out backwards how much we can borrow on that. Now, let's take the same scenario, 5,000 a month, but let's say I have a car payment. Let's change the color here so that we can see it's different. Let's say I have a car payment for 300. I have a student loan for 200 a month. Um, I have credit cards that I'm usually paying 200 a month, okay? So let's say two, four, $700 for consumer credit, not my telephone bill, not my you know living expenses, but consumer credit. They're gonna go back and look at my 5,000, okay? That's what I made per month. And they're gonna bump up the ratio a little bit. And they're gonna say, okay, you got consumer credit. We're gonna multiply your 5,000 a month by 36%, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at it. We're going to say 5000 a month times 36% is going to be $1,800. And the very first thing they're going to do there is immediately take off that $700 of consumer credit. And that leaves me with $1,100 per month for principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And that's how they do it. That's how your conventional loan works. Usually they use the ratios of 28 and 36. You will have to remember those. All right, you're gonna to have to get those. You'll get one of these questions at least, okay? So you might get it in a couple of different forms, formats, but you will get it, okay? You will get it. Um, the debt ratios for FHA loans are a little different, 31 and 43. VA loans are 41 altogether, but you need to be able to do this. All right, so let's go to the math packet again. Let's go to the math packet again. So our monthly income is 28%, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. If I have debts, consumer debts, it's 36 minus the debts, all right? So let's look at this first problem. A buyer's gross monthly income is $3,000. And his recurring debts are $150 for a college loan and $250 for credit cards. What's the maximum PITI the borrower can qualify for? All right, let us do this. Let's figure out both of them. Let's figure out both of them. So I'll help you with the first one. So the first thing, even if he didn't have any debts, what I could do is I can look at this and I can say, all right, if I did $3,000 a month times Let's say you didn't have any debt. I would multiply it by 28%. And then I would say, okay, so that means that it, we have 840 a, a month for principal interest taxes and insurance. Okay. But now he's got consumer debt. He's got 150 and 250. He's got $400 worth of consumer debt. So we have 3,000 times 36%. Okay, is gonna be 1080. And we're gonna immediately take off that $400. That's this 150 and 250, right? That leaves what? $680 for maximum PITI. Go ahead and do number two. You guys try, take a whack at number two. A man has an annual income of 38,000, a wife has an annual income of 35,000. 
They currently have recurring obligations, excluding housing expenses, of $600 per month. What's the maximum monthly payment for which this couple can qualify? Um, using an expense or income ratio for 28% of the gross and 36% of the gross income less recurring obligations. I want you to do it both ways for practice. Okay, there's a couple of things we have to figure out first, right? They gave us this in annual dollars. So we have 38,000 plus 35,000. So that's going to equal 73,000. We have to take that 73,000 and divide it by 12. Yes, everybody with? And that's going to equal 60, 83, 33 a month. All right, we all happy about that. Okay, so 60, 83, 33 is our number that we're dealing with. That is our gross monthly income. 60, 83.33 times 0.28. Our 28% is going to be what? 1703 with rounding. 1703. Now, we don't have to do anything. That would be our maximum PITI, 1703. But he's got $600 a month of recurring obligations. So we're going to bump that up a little bit and we're going to multiply it by 36%. And we're going to come up with a little bigger number which is 2190. But the first thing we have to do is take off that $600 in debt. All right. And then that's going to leave us with 1589, give or take fractions, right? That's gotta be our maximum PITI. As we're looking at this, if we know that some number times 28% is gonna give me my principal interest in taxes and insurance. If I know what my principal interest taxes and insurance is gonna be, if I divide it, remember our T? If I divide it by our percentage, I should get what our minimum income is, right? How much per month? So let's look at this. Number one. A buyer wants to, on page 35, a buyer wants to borrow $150,000. Her recurring debt, her recurring expenses are $300 a month for her car and $200 a month for credit card debt, okay? The lender tells her that the PITI will be $1,000 a month. What's the annual minimum income she must have to qualify for the loan? All right. And let's do it both ways. Let's do it both ways. All right. So I'll do this first one with you. I know that I have $1,000. That's my principal interest taxes and insurance. All right. So $1,000 PITI. And I know that some number times 28% gives me that. If I use my magic T here, 1,000.28, all I'm gonna do is do what? I'm gonna divide it, right? It's really all I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna take this and I'm going to divide 1,000 by 0.28. And that's gonna give me the number that I'd have to make for, for income. I would need to make 35.71 and 43 cents per month times 12 months. And that's going to give me 42.857, 42.857 and 14 cents. I would have to make that much money. We have debt, right? We have debt. So we have to add some stuff back here. All right. So we have $1,000. 
And then we have $500 worth of debt that we have to give them. We have to get back, right? Because some number times 36% was, and then what, what did they do? They took off the debt and they gave us the rest of PITI. So we have to put back that debt. So it'd be a thousand plus the 500 in debt is gonna equal some number times 36, right? So that 1500, 1500 is gonna be divided by 0.36, right? 0.36. That 0.36 is going to be 41.66 and 67 cents times 12 months. And that means we're going to have to make $50,000 annually. Okay. Yeah. Very good. James got it. 50K. That's what you have to go. So we have to add that back. We have to add our PITI and the money that they took off for, for the, for the um, credit card debt, right? And add it back. Now, I know we said principal interest taxes and insurance. If we have homeowners association dues, they are part of our monthly expenses. So it would be principal interest, taxes, insurance, and homeowners association dues. If a question has HOA dues in it, it becomes part of our monthly expense. Part of our addition, okay? So in this particular case, if we had $1,000, that would add in principal interest tax insurance. And then if we had HOA, that would be part of it too. So they would add that in, much like in question number two. So question number two says, a borrower wants to obtain, borrower wants to obtain a conventional loan for $156,000 with a principal interest uh, taxes and insurance of $1,300 per month. The buyer's HOA dues will be $50 per month. The buyer's car payment is $285 and the other recurring monthly debt is $300. What's the minimum monthly income required to qualify? What's the minimum monthly income required to qualify? All right. So we, in order to do this, and I'll help you through this one because I want you to see this. All right. In order to do this, we're going to have to add that fifty bucks in here. So it's thirteen hundred plus the fifty dollars. All right. So that's going to give me thirteen fifty. That thirteen fifty has got to be divided by. If it's divided by 28, if we don't have any consumer credit, we're going to get our answer, right? So we don't, let's do it. We're going to divide it. So our monthly income, if we divide that by um, 0.28, is going to be what? 48.21? Anybody else get that? Divide that out. Okay. Now we have some debt though, right? We have some debt. So we have 1350, which is our principal interest, taxes, insurance, and HOA. And we have to add to that buyer's car payment of 285 and other re recurring debt of 300. So that's $585. Mm -hmm. And that's going to equal what? That's going to equal um, 1935. That 1935 is 36% of some number. All right. That's going to come to 53.75. And then if we need an annual number, we can multiply that by 12. That's the monthly, and that's what they ask for. So I'm going to have to make 53.75 in order to meet these parameters. Number five on page 36. A prospective buyer makes $4,000 a month with the following expenses. Car payment, visa payment, groceries, phone bill. What's the maximum house payment this buyer can qualify for under a conventional loan? Do it both ways. We want to learn both ways. We want to practice it. Now, remember something here. And I'm going to give away because for time's sake. 
We are only interested in consumer credit. We're not worried about house expenses here. So groceries are house expenses. They don't get put in there. Phone bills are normal house expenses. That doesn't get put in there. But your car payment, your visa payment, both of those get put in there, okay? When you're doing your 36. Groceries don't, phone bill doesn't, your electric bill wouldn't, any of that. The other stuff though is consumer credit. So there you go, $4,000 without any debt, 28%, 11.20 uh, per month for PITI. If we're gonna use this consumer debt, we gotta multiply it by 36%, comes to 1440 immediately minus that $370 debt would be 1070 PITI. All right, I'll leave the rest of these to, for you to finish. I wanna show you just a couple of more things here. All right, so, Please note that an FHA loan, their ratios are 31% for housing expenses and 43 if you have recurring debt. So theirs are a little higher, so you can get more money, right? So instead of 28 and 36, FHA is 31 and 43, right? So you can get some more money even on a higher loan amount. And the VA is 41% across the board, whether you have it or not. Okay, there's no separate. Um, residual income and a maximum 41% ratio of gross. And they have to qualify on both income and debt ratios. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.